Welcome class. This week has been exam practical. So now we're moving on. And in class, I'll talk about the talk about the exams, et cetera. So uh, I'm gonna jump into the beginning of our, our next section. The bulk of it will be cardiovascular system. So today's lecture, I'll talk about the heart in general and the heart anatomy. Talk about the valves, the vessels, the chambers, everything like that. I'm gonna see you in person, we'll talk about some heart functions. And uh, I had a cardiac and nurse friend who told me that there was uh, uh, plumbers and electricians in the heart world. And the plumbers work on faulty valves and uh, inade inadequacy of the muscle. The electricians work on the electrical system, the nodes and uh, the conduction system of the heart. And both of these things gotta be working correctly for this, this heart to be. Um, but hopefully you reflect back. And if you did it right, you uh, have a good understanding of the endocrine system. You understand your glands and the hormones and that they course through your through your veins with uh, receptors on target cells that react to those hormones, right? Epinephrine, growth hormone, thyroid hormone, uh, estrogen, all these things having myriad effects <clears throat> on your body's metabolism, its blood pressure, how much water is retained by the kidneys, right? And uh, the amount of blood sugar you have, uh, epinephrine and cortisol, you know, important in that. So. And of course, insulin and glucagon are important for your blood sugar. So all these things uh, um, uh, being controlled by the hormones in your body. And then the blood chapter. You guys now know uh, what the components of blood, especially, you know, uh, um, the red blood cells and how big they are, how they're filled with hemoglobin, how they bind oxygen. And we'll really get into that, uh, the next section with the respiratory system. We'll talk about how the red blood cells pick up oxygen and, and dump off carbon dioxide and et cetera. And you know, they last about 120 days and you know how, where they're made and what they need to be made and where they're broken down. And, uh, and then the white blood cells, you know, the different types. And uh, the next chapter will we'll really get into uh, what those lymphocytes do, B cells and T cells. And uh, uh, I'll talk about, uh, I'll add a little section about how exactly how the COVID-19 vaccine, vaccines and the ones we have uh, work and uh, some good stuff there. And, and then the other part of blood is the plasma. You know, the proteins in the blood and it carries uh, gases and nutrients and the hormones and antibodies, you know. So um, we need this blood to pump in our body. And uh, uh, it's, the blood is one thing, it's, you, you can see what it does, but uh, it does you no good unless it's perfused all of your tissues. Your brain needs oxygen and glucose and every part of your body does, your muscles when you're on that treadmill. <clears throat> and so the only thing the heart does is the muscles that it creates uh, pressure, a great pressure in the ventricles. And that's gonna force air or, or liquid always goes from high to low pressure. So it'll eject the blood out of your heart and it will travel in your body. And you can, can feel your pulse here. It's slight delay with each heartbeat, you'll feel your pulse as the, the blood is forced through those uh, arteries and then little tiny capillaries, microscopic, where exchange takes place. And then the veins will take it back up to your heart and then to your lungs to be recharged, back to your heart. Oh, great stuff. All right, but I just gave you the lecture. No, no, okay, there's lots more to do. So yeah, let's get right to it. All right. And first, uh, yeah, we'll take a step back. <clears throat> so the basics, and I have five lectures. This is a short one here, um, but I'll give two in person and then three little recorded ones. And I, I chose um, heart anatomy and talking about vestal anatomy. You know, these things I think can be taught online. And then in person, I'll, I'll try to hit the more complex things like. ECGs and blood pressure and uh, some of those things. So that's, that's the plan. And you guys can, can read the meaty chapter on this. Uh, cardiovascular system is gonna be your heart and all the blood vessels that carry uh, the blood throughout your body. It's kind of apropos because uh, Valentine's Day is coming up this weekend. So we're right at the heart. It's just perfectly uh, planned there, of course. All right, so uh, what's going on? You can see, uh, Clearly, when you think about blood, the first thing you think of the red blood cells is, oh, it's going to carry oxygen to my working muscles and my working brain. And whenever you burn sugar, every glucose is burned and all those carbons come off as carbon dioxide. They bubble out and the blood has to take it back to your lungs. And so the lungs have all these blood vessels where exchange takes place with that oxygen carbon dioxide. 
And then you eat a meal. Uh, your gut capillaries are going to absorb just the basic things, right? Not like a cheeseburger comes in there, a big hunk of it, right? But uh, amino acids, and simple sugars, and, and simple fats, they'll be absorbed into your bloodstream, and then you can use them in your body for energy or repair. We just did endocrine system. So the blood is necessary to carry your hormones throughout your body. And the immune system, right? Uh, the, all those white blood cells that we saw in your blood smear, those things were all um, uh, uh, part of the immune system. And um, if you get an infection, all those neutrophils will, will, will head there, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And I was talking about antibodies too. The lymphocytes make antibodies and they travel in the bloodstream looking for uh, foreign invaders. And waste products, of course, you're breaking down sugars and fats. Sugar is mostly carbon dioxide. Uh, you break down protein and stuff. There'll be nitrogenous substances, creatinine, urea, all these things uh, travel in the blood. And it's your kidneys that filter just a huge hunk of blood, like 25% of your blood that goes to your kidneys with each heartbeat. And that's their big filters to get rid of a lot of waste products. And of course, heat exchange. It's the way that we heat up and cool down our body really um, and you know when it's when it's hot you get flush and blood is shunted to your surface and then you can even sweat and that will carry away the heat uh, and if you're too cold you can even shiver and you can um, uh, burn sugars use energy and that blood will carry that warmth from your core to the extremities too all right and you guys are experts on blood but you all know you well, it makes up blood, you spin it down, you're gonna have a plasma on top, right? There we go, yeah. It will be about you know, almost half and half-ish. Um, and then uh, the red blood cells will, will send a huge down to the bottom. And uh, these components of the blood, don't forget what they do. I think, don't think you will. And taking a look at it, of course, you know, all these red blood cells, right? And then uh, the ones that kind of jump out at you is being like much rarer that have a nucleus or the white blood cells. That's a weird red blood cell. It's got a old bump on it from lab. But yeah, looking at it, you can see <clears throat> mostly you've got these red blood cells without a nucleus. None of them have a brain. They are just sacks of hemoglobin that uh, are going to uh, take miles and miles through your body to help deliver the oxygen and carbon dioxide is what they do. And the white blood cells you see here, the purple ones, of course, for your immune system, they're going to uh, look for uh, bad guys. Now blood, <clears throat> we look at human blood here, but realize it's strange that, that mammals don't have a nucleus in their, in their blood, the red blood cells, right? You see fish do, amphibians do reptiles, birds, birds are reptiles too. But yeah, but they have a nucleus. This is your typical red blood cell. It's just uh, when you look at mammals, uh, we've popped out that nucleus. And so our, our red blood cells have no nucleus. And uh, it's, um, they have no ability to, to repair themselves. <clears throat> so they don't last that long. Um, but they've got more room in there for uh, hemoglobin. You know, they're just little sacks of hemoglobin. And just as an aside, camels, and I think llamas, things like that, have a slightly different shape uh, red blood cells. They can go from being very dehydrated you know, to very hydrated. And so I think it's a little more stable, the idea, but just so you know, fun facts. All right, so looking at it, your heart. Talk about your heart right there. Yeah, I got one, I can feel it. And uh, that is what the muscle, that muscle is working every day, day and night, right? From before you're born until you die. It's often, will tell you that you're dead is when the heart stops. Um, and uh, it's just that muscle contraction causes pressure in this chamber to increase. And that's gonna pump the blood, keep this, the blood flowing. And you have a system of four valves in there that are keep blood flowing in one direction. And then uh, as a definition, arteries carry blood away from the heart. <clears throat> and veins are taking blood to the heart. That's an important distinction there. Uh, you can't just say that arteries carry oxygenated blood and veins deoxygenated because there is an exception in the pulmonary system in your lungs. So as a definition, arteries, blood away, veins toward the heart. And in the arteries and veins that you see when you do uh, gross anatomy, dissection, anything like that, the blood is not 
exchanging anything there. It's just on a highway. Uh, only when it gets to the capillaries, which are just the smallest, they're the, about the diameter of a red blood cell, just a little bit bigger. So the red blood cells can push through there. The blood is moving very slowly through the capillaries and it has time to exchange nutrients and oxygen and gases and everything. So the capillaries are where the action takes place. The arteries and veins, the blood is moving much faster and more volume, but uh, it's just going somewhere. All right, and this is kind of an important um, uh, concept here. When you look at the circulatory system. So um, what you have is the heart producing pressure, which is gonna move the blood. And when it gets to the capillaries where things happen, capillaries are leaky. See that they have uh, gaps between the endothelial cells there, the squamous cells, and they're very leaky. And so that pressure will push out fluid. So your blood pressure pushes out the water. Now the red blood cells stay in there, they're too big. And the white blood cells, unless they're moving out, they stay in there and big proteins stay in there. So some things stay in the bloodstream, but small things, and of course gases can, can just leave the blood uh, and go into the tissues. So you don't have red blood cells bumping into cells of your body. They stay in the vessels, all right? But the water in there, the fluid is pushed out and it washes over the cells. And so the cells, they're needy, they need oxygen, they need nutrients. And so the water constantly washes over them and it delivers that. And then very importantly, remember the blood has those uh, albumins, those proteins, then that water is gonna be sucked back in by osmosis to return back to the heart. And if you're starvation and you don't have enough protein, then the water stays in the fluid. The fluid stays in the tissues. You know, it's called edema or swelling. Water fills up your tissues and you look very swollen. Uh, indeed. So that is the, and I'll get to a little bit more, but that's the main idea is that your blood pressure pushes out the fluid, it washes over the cells to do its thing, and then it gets sucked back into the blood to return back. And so you have this constant washing out of your capillaries and back in, and that's gonna deliver uh, nutrients and, and take wastes away from the tissue. Yeah. And these capillary beds are the key. You have capillary beds in the skin of my face that may open up when I'm in a hot tub, uh, in my hands, in my guts, and everywhere there's these capillary beds. And your brain opens and closes these capillary beds. You know, they can't open all of them. You just drop dead with no blood pressure. So your body, if you eat a meal, they open up in your gut and blood rushes into your gut. You get on that uh, treadmill and they close to the gut and they open in your muscles. And uh, so your body controls um, where the blood goes. Because these capillary beds, they have a little gatekeeper, little arterioles with a sphincter that can close off or open up. They can constrict or dilate. Yeah. All right. And then I mentioned that the water gets sucked back into the blood, but I guess looking at this, I probably should just give you the truth here. Not all the water comes that leaves the blood comes back into the blood. There's always a little bit of excess and that is carried away by the lymphatic system, lymph vessels. So you see these green tubes in this illustration here? Those are the lymph vessels and they take the water back slowly back to the bloodstream in your heart, but they make they take a long time to get there. And on the way, they go through lymph nodes, which can filter that water and look for bad guys too. All right, I'm giving you guys a lot here, a lot, a lot, but uh, that's okay. I'm gonna get into each of these things a little bit more, but big picture, that blood pressure drives water out of your capillaries, your cells get the delivery, the water comes back in because of osmosis, but a little bit of excess is carried away in the lymph vessels, and then I'll show you how they carry them back to the blood. All right, here's some some stats. You know, if I, what if I, you know, you can't not be amazed studying anatomy and physiology by the heart. You know, and even lay people, I mean, yeah, it's amazing that uh, 48 million gallons. <laughs> you know, I think of that. Oh my God, it contracts two and a half billion times average person's lifetime. Yeah, the thing goes, it just goes and goes and goes, right? You imagine how tired you get from, you know, running a, a race and your heart just says, eh, it's nothing, I, I go constantly, right? 
Uh, one stat you should know, I think you know already that you have about five liters of blood in your body, about five liters. An interesting fact is that your heart pumps at rest about five liters per minute. So easy to remember is that all the blood in your body goes through every minute. How's that? And you may have 60 beats per minute, you know, heart rate, whatever it is. Just know that it's about five liters per minute uh, and goes through your heart. Easy to remember, just coincidentally, it's just about the amount of blood you have in your body. All right, let's take a look. Yeah. And uh, then we get to the point where we're going to talk about the hearts. <clears throat> We have a four-chambered heart. It's really two pumps in one. We have a right and a left side. And on the right side, it's going to pump it to the lungs. And it's going to come back to the left side. The left side is going to pump it to your body. And we call those two circuits. And pulmonary means lungs. So pulmonary circuit is lungs. Pulmonary arteries, pulmonary veins, pulmonary embolism, pulmonary lungs. And then systemic is the system. That's going to go out your aorta. They come up your carotid arteries, to your head, and your, your arms and legs. And this shows it, um, our heart is completely separated to right and left sides. And in a frog, it's not, it has only one ventricle and so it's mixing, but there's no mixing here on our right and left side in, in normal people. Uh, you have uh, blood that's gonna come from the body after it's been used up, all the oxygen, into this right side. Oops. Yep. And then um, the right side is gonna pump it uh, out to the lungs in the pulmonary circuit. And the lungs, of course, huge surface area, you're gonna exchange oxygen and carbon dioxide. So by the time it returns back to the left side of the heart, it's all loaded up with oxygen, ready to go to the body to be useful. And the left side is your systemic circuit. And this is a much stronger chamber because that pumps it out to your body, the systemic circuit all over. So on your right side, it simply has to pump it to the lungs, which happen to be right next to the heart, not that far. But then uh, when you pump it out to your body, it's gonna leave your aorta and it's gotta go to your tips of your toes and the tips of your fingers. So there's a lot more pressure on that left side. But we can talk about right side pulmonary, left side is systemic circuit. And they go simultaneously, simultaneously. So it's pretty cool to see an animation of all this happening at once. But um, when the ventricles contract, the blood is shot from the right side out to your lungs, the left side out to your body. And as they relax, they fill up it all happens simultaneously. So another amazing thing about the heart is that it's reactive. You know, you think about your sump pump and you know, other pumps, um, your fuel pump in your car, you know, things like that. Uh, you have pumps where you turn them on and they work and then they turn off. Uh, your heart uh, reacts to, you know, as soon as you, you sit up in the morning, your blood pressure goes up, your heart increases. And then when you exercise, it increases more. And then when you're resting, it goes slower. So it has this beautiful ability uh, uh, to change, and we call it the cardiac output. That's how much blood you pump out of your heart. And if you're doing a sprint, your cardiac output has to be maximum. You need tons of blood to, to fuel those, uh, those muscles. And uh, when you're resting, your cardiac output is a fraction of that. You just need the basic amount of uh, blood to, to survive. All right. And we'll talk later about functioning is how your heart knows to do that. You know, it turns out exercising, you actually anticipate it. Like you get on the treadmill, you think to yourself, oh, maybe it's because my oxygen levels have dropped, my heart goes up. You actually, just the fact of exercising, your mind knows you're going to need more oxygen. It freaking starts early. Uh, that's really, really cool. In other cases, you know, when your oxygen levels drop, Really, when your carbon dioxide levels build up, your heart will pump harder to, to try to get rid of that carbon dioxide and deliver more oxygen. All right, we'll get to these things. All right, let's look at the anatomy. Yeah, it's roughly uh, cone shaped, like this. And we call this the base of the heart that has the vessels coming off of it here. That's the base of the heart. And this is the apex down at the end. And if you were to look inside, you're gonna see there's gonna be four chambers. We'll get, we'll get right to that. Um, the big chambers in the bottom are called the ventricles. You have a right and left ventricle. And then you've got a right and left atria on top. So an atrium, oh, like an atrium in a building is like a little area you go in. 
like in a bank. It has like a little the doors and then you continue on, you know, or beginning of the house. So atrium and the ventricles are, are a bunch of bigger spaces down below. Uh, when you look at hearts, um, those of you in gross anatomy, you can see human hearts to see, is it really the size of a fist? That's usually a little bit bigger than that. Um, but it sits in your chest cavity. Uh, and um, it's gonna sit underneath your sternum, your breastbone. And most people goes to the left. There's rare cases it goes to the right, dextrocardia, but it goes to your left and uh, it'll start up here, your second rib and go down to like your, your, your fifth intercostal space. And so you have approximately the area where your heart is and it's gonna be uh, just superior to your diaphragm. Oh, let's see here. All right, look at it here, yeah. Just above your diaphragm, just below your sternum or breastbone. And then posterior to it will be your thoracic vertebrae. And on each lateral side is gonna be your lungs. So you guys picture this? And your heart is beating like crazy inside of this sac. And it's attached to the diaphragm. The diaphragm is going up and down as you breathe. So the heart is going up and down as it's beating, right? So a lot of movement going on in your chest. Your, your, your ribs are all moving up and down. Your heart is raising and lifting as it's beating in that sac. Yeah. And the lungs are on either side of it. Yeah. Good stuff. Yeah. And of course, people that are bigger have bigger hearts. And we'll also talk about enlarged heart as being, uh, it's good in athletes. And it's also bad because it's a, a pathology often in a large heart. Yeah, so there it sits. Look at that. Off to the left a little bit. And so uh, we had a normal lab and be able to uh, listen to our own hearts if we're quiet enough and put a stethoscope. And it's actually places where you, um, yeah, we know to listen for various valve issues. And so, yeah, we'll get into it a little bit in, in lab in person. Oh, I can't, I, I, I feel I'd be neglecting this if I didn't talk about why we think the heart is a seat of love and why the, sh the shape of the heart is, is really not very anatomically correct. Um, but the heart, and when you fall in love, uh, when you, or when you're attracted to someone, your heart beats faster. It's really your brain. Your brain is causing your heart to be faster. So you can see the kind of the connection there and the heartache after a loss or a breakup. Uh, also, your fight or flight response can sometimes jar the heart. But in any case, uh, it was, Back before we, we knew the functions of the organs, the heart is often seen as the center of uh, love and emotion, things like that. Um, the shape of it, this shape, this heart that we see on Valentine's Day cards, uh, there's some thought that it came from this uh, sylphium, which was a plant. Uh, the Romans and, and Greeks would use it uh, as an aphrodisiac, as birth control too. Not sure if it really worked. Um, and as a spice, but uh, this was a valuable plant. It's not thought to be extinct. Uh, it used to it li lived in a, a small area, and there's coins where it was used. The shape of this pod was heart shaped, so maybe it has to do also a treatment for mental illness, so the madness of love that goes along with that, or the aphrodisiac part of it um, is one idea of how this heart shape came to be found on all our Valentine's cards and such. But anyway, it's kind of interesting. But your brain is where love is. It's all about chemistry. Your heart will react, you know, if you uh, if you fall in love as well. But it's pumping blood, right? It's not very romantic, I know. All right, you guys. So let's get right down to some anatomy. This is a beautiful view. If you were to, you can YouTube and look at open heart surgeries. It's pretty amazing how they do that. That thing's popping around in there in this sack filled with fluid in there. But your heart sits you know, beneath your sternum in a pericardial sac. Pericardium, like perimeter of your cardia, which is your heart, so it goes around it. And you got a tough fibrous portion there, really, really super tough out there. On the inside, you have this kind of shiny view, and then on the heart, it's kind of shiny too. And that shininess is because that pericardial sac will secrete a little bit of lubricating fluid. And the fibrous part gives it its toughness, but then there's uh, two layers there where the heart, it moves nicely. There's no friction, so it moves nicely. If it doesn't, there can be an, an infection, pericarditis. You can hear it, you know, like, a, like a rubbing, but normally it's just smooth. So the heart's just beating. You know, it could be like 100 times a minute. So there's a lot of action going on there, and you want a nice lubricating surface. 
So this sack, uh, really freaking tough, really, really tough. And uh, um, uh, in this case, the heart's been removed. You get a kind of kind of cool view of this. And you guys know the it sits on the diaphragm. It sits right on the diaphragm. It's connected there by, by ligaments. And it's connected to the inside of your sternum by ligaments. So it's, it's tethered in there, but there's a lot of movement going on. Um, and you can see if you remove the heart, you got to cut all the vessels coming and going to it. And you'll see uh, superior inferior vena cava, uh, where blood comes back into the heart. Then the big vessels leaving the heart will be your huge aorta going to your body. And then the pulmonary trunk taking it out to your lungs. And then once you get to the lungs, it comes back to the left side through these four little pulmonary veins. Let me give you a little preview. You remove the heart, you see the sac there. You're gonna see those are the, the tubes that have to be cut to remove the heart. And then looking at this pericardium or pericardial sac, you see on the inside, there'll be a little space with a little bit of fluid. And that's the pericardial sac or space between the, the membranes. All right, so in terms of terminology, what I want you to know is this. You've got a fibrous layer of your pericardium on the outside. Tons of collagen fibers, wicked strong. You can't rip it, you gotta cut it with a scalpel, really, really strong. And then this is actually, it's, it's, uh, it's continuous actually, but you're gonna have a nice, delicate, wet membrane on the inside of that fibrous layer. That's gonna come up, that's gonna go on the heart itself. It's going to be a thin, same kind of wet membrane on the heart muscle. And we're going to label these the fibrous pericardium. And then here we'll call it the parietal pericardium, parietal. And this will be the visceral pericardium. It's also known as the epicardium. That's on the heart itself. It makes the heart shiny. The muscular part of your heart is called the myocardium. Myo is muscle. It's all cardiac muscle and connective tissue and blood vessels and nerves, but that's the muscle. And then the inner layers of your heart that lines the whole inside is the endocardium. So that's pretty easy. You have epicardium, myocardium, endocardium on the inside. The endocardium is shiny. It's also going to coat the valves and goes into the vessels. All right, I'm gonna show you again. So taking a look, you see your heart is enclosed in the sac. It has a wicked strong fibrous layer. Then the inside is gonna be a parietal layer. It's shiny and wet. And then on the heart, it's gonna be a shiny wet layer. And those wet layers will slide by each other. And what I talked about how it's a continuous sac is that, um, yeah, we'll, uh, I talked about this, God, the first lecture was a long time ago in um, AMP1. But what happens here is that uh, you have one membrane, and the heart develops and it pushes into that membrane, much like going in this, 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 this balloon. And um, so you, you end up with a layer on the heart and a layer on the inside of the sac, but they're continuous. See what I mean? It was just, it's pushed into it. And so they slide by each other, but on top, you can see they are continuous. So I want you to know the visceral and parietal layers of the pericardium, uh, they're connected. And just when you look at the heart itself, they, they look like two membranes that slide by each other. Okay. And there's a fibrous layer on top of this. All right. And then again, if you were to get a slice of heart, and heart's delicious. When I shoot a deer, I, I, I pickle the heart. I cook it and then with some onions and vinegar and, and sugar and the, it's delicious big chunk of heart or make a heart sandwich anyway. um, on the heart is going to have the inner layer that lines it makes it shiny on the inside so the blood is on this nice shiny surface is the endocardium and the endocardium also that covers all the valves we're going to see and it leaves and it's continuous with the vessels so blood always has this shiny smooth surface remember if it's rough you could have some clotting going on so the inside of the heart, all the vessels, all the valves are covered by the smooth endocardium. Yeah. And it's going to try to prevent the blood from clotting to keep things moving and smooth. And we'll see uh, in a moment, some uh, Purkinje fibers will be some nerves that help conduct it, conduct the signal, electrical signal, but we'll get to that. Myocardium is cardiac muscle and uh, super thick in the ventricles especially the left ventricle is the biggest, the thickest, because that's where you need the most power. 
And the epicardium, you can see also known as a visceral pericardium, is going to be the layer on the heart that makes the heart shiny. And it's, so if you look at a heart, you look at a sheep heart, you'll see it in the lab <clears throat> the next two weeks. Um, it's gonna be shiny. And uh, if you, you peel that away, I'll show you a picture. There's gonna be blood vessels, lots of fat in the heart too. So here we go. So taking a look at the hearts, you can see the myocardium is all this muscle. That's the power, right? And then on top of it, you'll see uh, an epicardium and then a little space and then a, a layer out there. You can see blood vessels. Um, this is actually all, this is actually, I'm sorry, this is actually going to be epicardium out here. You're going to see below it's going to be on the heart has lots of, and the grooves has fat and blood vessels that go to the whole heart. And the heart muscle, as we learned early on, we studied muscles is a cardiac muscle. And some of the unique things about cardiac muscle is it doesn't tire. Well, it doesn't fatigue. It doesn't go through tetanus. So, and it's, it's uh, very um, aerobic right? Because it goes forever. Um, I say forever until you die. Um, filled with mitochondria and uh, you have these intercalated discs. Remember those little discs? And that's where this might be a cardiac muscle cell. And it's a big nucleus. And so it's going to connect to other muscle cells. And another one, let's say it goes like this. Yeah, so these discs are where two cardiac muscle cells connect. And there are gap junctions there that allow when one muscle cell contracts, the signal quickly goes to the next one so that your heart muscle contracts as one. You don't want them to go like be this wave, you know. You want it to be just one as it contracts because they're connected in these intercalated discs intimately. I like this, this really, this shows the probe is pulling out a little bit like a saran wrap on the heart surface. And that'll be the epicardium or visceral pericardium, it has two names. Yeah, I'm looking at that, I can tell the shininess that it's still there. And this yellow, I can see fat, you see that? And you see blood vessels that run through that fat. All right, here's the first I'll talk about. Of course, I'll talk about heart attacks and stroke and all that. I will talk about uh, pericarditis and endocarditis because these are very, very uh, common things that happen. And so if you have an inflammation or infection of this, um, these membranes that we're talking about, it's really serious, of course, right? So pericarditis is when you have um, on the, the outer part, the pericardial sac somewhere, you have some kind of infection, inflammation. And so... When you listen to the heart, it's no longer smooth. You can actually hear that. You can hear that rubbing going on. And, that's, and there'll be pain and there'll be, uh, usually fluid starts building up. And here, I'll tell you this. Um, so you see pericardial effusion. You see too much fluid comes out. And it could be damage to your heart can cause blood to come out. But imagine this pericardial sac. If fluid starts building up, you're not a thin film for lubrication, but imagine milliliters and milliliters start building up. What happens is that that fibrous pericardium is so tough that the fluid builds up inside of the pericardial sac and the pressure will squeeze the heart so it can no longer fill. It's called cardiac tamponade and very dangerous. You can have either there's blood or fluid that fills your pericardial sac so much that it, the pressure keeps the heart from filling and you're dead unless they do something. And then they'll stick a needle in your chest to release that fluid and then your heart can beat again. But that pressure that builds up if the sac is filled with some kind of fluid, it's cardiac tamponade and it's uh, uh, deadly. And it can happen with pericarditis if uh, a bunch of fluid starts uh, leaking out. All right, endocarditis um, is when you have an infection of the endocardium. And uh, it's often you see this in IV drug users and such, because uh, in that case, imagine you take a needle and you, you're putting in your skin, you know, daily all the time. Well, you have bacteria that grow on your, your, your skin, uh, staph, staphylococcus, and um, that you, you push them into the, the vein and the vein goes back to your heart. And it turns out these bacteria, staph and strep, um, streptococcus, um, can grow on your heart valves and the inside of your heart. Uh, yeah. And it can also happen even during tooth surgery because your mouth is filled with um, strep bacteria, right? And so sometimes after a dental procedure, if the um, 
some of those bacteria from your dirty mouth get into your uh, bloodstream, return to your heart, and then they start growing on your on your, your, your valves. And so what you'll see in this picture is that you have these vegetations are gross on your valves or in the inside of your heart. And on the valves, they start making the valves incompetent where they don't work right because they're covered as plaque and they're hard and uh, narrowed. Yeah. So endocarditis um, happens when you have bacteria that grow in the endocardium, the inside of your, uh, your heart, especially on the valves. And uh, there's various presentations. It can be a sudden life-threatening thing or it can be a slow thing, but uh, you know, some serious antibiotics and uh, possibly even some valve replacement is necessary. All right, so pericarditis or endocarditis, if there's infection on the pericardium or the endocardium, inside or outside of your heart. All right. Finally, it's, uh, I say finally, I've said a couple times. And now going to the anatomy, let's just, I'm going to talk about uh, heart anatomy. And again, you guys, you're going to have uh, CuraCloud Labs immediately. You'll see that up uh, next week to be studying that in lab and outside of lab. I'm going to lecture on it. You can read the book, but uh, I'll kind of run you through uh, the chambers of the heart, et cetera. Uh, so you can listen, let that sink in, and then, uh, and then get to know. All right. So when I look at the... Uh, basically, yeah, four chambers to your heart. Uh, I'll just draw it. Yeah, I'm just gonna draw it. So here's your heart, basically. And uh, let's see. Uh, there we go. And so look at the heart. This is you're looking at a patient right here. Uh, this would be your right atrium, your left atrium, your right ventricle, and your left ventricle. So those are the four chambers. And if you look at the size of them, I kind of exaggerate the atria a little bit, but I'll draw the walls here. And I'm drawing the left ventricle much thicker walled. Yeah, I'm, yeah. You guys can anticipate, you guys can appreciate this. So you can see that left ventricle, super strong, really, really thick. And it's, you don't even know you need to like orient the heart. You can just look and say, oh, it's the left ventricle because it's much stronger. Because again, the pressure that it has to generate has to push blood out through your whole body. The right side just has to go to your lungs. They're just next door. All right, so blood, let's see. Uh, oh, that's weird. Okay. Oh. Oh, there we go. All right. Cool. All right. Awesome. So blood is going to come to your heart. This is blood. I'm drawing it blue because it's deoxygenated or has less oxygen. It's come back to your heart to be recharged. And the two big vessels here are going to be your superior vena cava and your inferior vena cava, which means cavernous veins. There's a superior from your head, inferior from your legs and the rest of your body, right? Yeah, so these two big cavernous veins are bringing all the blood back to your heart. Superior from your head and your arms, and then the inferior from your chest and your legs, the whole body up like that. And there's one other, there's gonna be a little hole here, and that's gonna be the, the opening of the coronary sinus. There's gonna be an opening in there where the heart muscle itself, the blood drains into that right atrium. So the right atrium takes all of the blood that needs to be recharged in your lungs. It's going to come back from your whole body into that right atrium. It's the receptacle in your heart for all the blood. Then that blood has to go into the right ventricle. You'll see most of it passively comes down, but then the atria will contract and squeeze more. And then it's in the right ventricle. Then where's it going to go? This is blood that's blue. It's got to go to the lungs. It's got to go to the lungs. So It'll come out the right ventricle. We call this the, the uh, pulmonary trunk. And it will go to the right pulmonary artery and the left pulmonary artery. So blood leaves the right ventricle out the pulmonary trunk, pulmonary means lungs, and it goes out the pulmonary arteries to the lungs. Yep, in the lungs, it goes in capillaries, gonna pick up 
oxygen is going to get rid of carbon dioxide. And it's going to come back into the left atrium. It turns out there's usually in humans about four, four vessels that are going to take the um, blood from the lungs back to the left atrium. And these will be brought back in uh, pulmonary veins. And I mentioned veins, big V, little V, arteries, I'll do big A, little A like that. And nerves will be big A, little one, just instead of writing out veins. So pulmonary arteries, take it to the lungs, pulmonary veins back to the left atrium. And that blood is good, man. It's filled with oxygen, ready to go to the body. For the left atrium, it's got to go down to the left ventricle. And then it pumps out the huge aorta. The aorta is the big vessel that leaves, that's going to take the blood to your body. That's a huge vessel. Woo! All right. My drawings are a little, little busy, isn't it? Um, yeah. And so that's taking blood out to your body. So that's the pathway of blood. It's going to go into the right atrium, to the right ventricle, out the pulmonary arteries to the lungs, pulmonary veins to the left atrium, down to the left ventricle, out the aorta to your body. All that happens. All right. I'll give you some more anatomy. Um, yeah, I'll put it on here. I get a little busy, but so the wall between the atrium and the ventricle, they're called the septum. Now, septal piercing is that wall between your nose. So this is going to be, right here would be the, the uh, interventricular septum. It's the wall between the two ventricles. And people can have, you've heard septal defects. Babies are born, and if there's a hole or a pathway for the blood, it'll go across. But normally, the septum should be a solid wall. And this, of course, would be the interatrial septum above. All right, and then let's take a look. Let's start in the right atrium. So we'll start in this right atrium. This is where uh, the blood, we really could start our journey. You could start anywhere, but imagine we're gonna start there. The blood returns to the heart in the right atrium. All right. Now it comes in there and it is going to uh, fill up your right atrium and then it's gonna travel down to the right ventricle. And there's gonna be a valve here. I'm gonna write, I'm gonna put three cusps. See those three cusps? It's often called the tricuspid. It's also called, we call these atrioventricular valves because it's between the atrium and the ventricles. So that'd be the right AV valve or the usually called the tricuspid. And these valves keep blood moving in one direction. And attached to these flappy valves, there's gonna be little cords, little tendons. And little tendons are gonna be attached onto the flaps of the valves onto these uh, little papilla, these little nubbins, these little muscle that comes off comes off the, the, the wall of the heart, these little muscles, and they're called papillary muscles. Are these, it's an extension of cardiac muscle. So when the heart contracts, the papillary muscles contract also, and they pull down on these, uh, I call them chordae tendinae, chordae. Today, which means tendinous cords. They're strings. They're really tough. So these often look like parachuters. People say it's like a little parachuter, and here's the here's the parachute. The little guy's the papillary muscle. And so what this does is it, these uh, these these valves. It's going to be both in the right and left side. It's um, when the pressure in the ventricle increases, these valves will snap shut, and the strings will prevent the valves from flipping up. So it stops them here called prolapsing, they go through here. So you want the valves to snap shut and those strings and the muscles keep the valves from going like this. So they don't shut the valves or open the valves. Opening and shutting the valves is a passive process just based on pressure. But the papillary muscles and the chordae tendae will keep the, the valves from, from flipping up. They'll stop them. All right, so you have those in both the right and left side. On the left side, the valve only has two cusps. So it's often called the bicuspid valve, or it'd be the left AV valve. You guys know the other name for it? It's the valve that causes the most trouble with people, the mitral valve. So I'll show you why it's 
what a mitre is. Yeah, so that valve has three names, left atrioventricular, mitral valve, or bicuspid, because it has two valves. All right. Let me take a look. What else? There are two more valves I need to talk about. So we have the bicuspid and tricuspid. And then in the aorta and in the pulmonary trunk, you have valves as well. I'm going to draw it to the side here. Let me draw. Oh, take it really big for you. Yeah. All right. So here's the aorta. It's going to be the aorta. And then there's going to be a pulmonary trunk. There we go. That's pretty good. So up here, what I've drawn for you is the uh, the two um, big main vessels that leave the heart. So the aorta is going to carry blood to your body. And the pulmonary trunk is going to be carrying it to your uh, to your lungs. And within it, you're going to have valves that look like this. They have three cusps. They're beautiful valves, beautiful, you'll see. Um, and they're called semi-lunar valves. Semi-lunar means a half moon, because they're kind of like that. And they, they come together beautifully, these three cusps. And there's no chordae tendinae or papillary muscles. They're just, they work on their own. And they're called easily enough. It's gonna be just your aortic valve, technically aortic semi-lunar valve. And this will be your pulmonary valve. How's that? How easy is that? So in the pulmonary trunk, you have the pulmonary valve and the aortic. In the aorta, you have the aortic valve. And then on the right side, between the atrium ventricles, you have the, the tricuspid. And the left side, you have the bicuspid. And those four valves where make the, the lub dub, make the sound of your heart, and they keep blood moving in one direction. And I'll show you how that works. All right, I think I think I'm going to leave it at that. But this picture is getting a little crazy, isn't it? Um, but pretty soon, I'll make you think about this. In this interatrial septum, what if I told you there was like a thumbprint of really uh, like an oval depression where it's really thin right there? Why? Maybe some of you know. If not, you'll all know by very, very soon. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, I didn't. Kind of crazy, but uh, there's a store-bought picture behind it that shows uh, all the valves and all the, the vessels that I just talked about. All right. And then looking at this is a could be a transverse section through the heart. We're taking a look. This is the left ventricle is much bigger than the right. It's also showing an issue here, but I wasn't trying to show that. So you can see the left side. The right side is often talked about like a, a pouch, a kangaroo pouch on the left. So the left ventricle is huge. That gives you the power. All right, a few more things uh, looking at the heart. So the right and left atria are the upper chambers. They're thin walled. They don't have a, they don't like generate a lot of pressure. The ventricles have the power down there. But each one of those atria have a little extension called oracles. See oracle? So you're going to have a right oracle and a left oracle. They're like little ears that kind of hug around the front of the heart. An oracle is another word for your outer ear, this part here. So they look like little dog ears that come around like that. And they're just like extra space for the, um, the atria. They're just, they're hollow inside. Uh, don't have much more to say about them. But realize you have an oracle, a little extension of the atria on the right and left side. And then when you look at this, you're gonna, you'll learn this in your, in your lab, but uh, you're gonna see there's gonna be a uh, uh, kind of a uh, indentation. Around, around the heart on top. And above it's the atria, below is the ventricles, called a sulcus. Yeah, sulcus. And a sulcus is a groove. For your dental hygiene people, you know, sulci, you know, plaque develops in the sulcus of your teeth. So the sulcus is a groove around um, uh, the heart between the atria and ventricles. There's another groove in the front and the back too, between, that's where the wall is, between the two ventricles. And in life, these grooves are filled with blood vessels and fat. So they kind of smooth out, but you can still tell there's a divot there. So we call this the coronary sulcus. And this would be the interventricular sulcus. Interventricular between the ventricles. It would be an anterior one and a posterior one in the front and back. So the names are not that hard. And anterior interventricular sulcus means the front of the heart, between the ventricles, there's a groove. And I guess to be honest with you guys, cardiac means heart, all right? 
but coronary uh, means crown. Not that interesting, huh? And so it almost is like a, if you look at the heart, it has a crown above, you know, it goes around, it kind of comes above there. All right. All right, and one other thing I'll show you on here, you can see the big aorta coming up, and these would be the major vessels that this is carrying blood to your arms and to your head. Uh, then it'll go down to go to your legs. Um, and then you'll see the pulmonary trunk comes out to the big pulmonary arteries that are carrying blood out to your lungs, right? And I want you to see this. Look at this. There's a little, it's called the arterial ligament, ligamentum arteriosum, if you want to Greek it up or, yeah, probably. Um, you have a little ligament here. So weird. It connects the aorta and the pulmonary trunk right there. Uh, this is the question I posed earlier, so I'm going to answer it. Uh, maybe next, I'll see. But uh, what it is, is that you, when you, you guys, if I was to dissect you, I would find a ligament here. Even if I looked in the inside of the aorta, it'd be a little dimple, a little dimple right there. Sometimes causes problems, but there's a little ligament there. And then between the atria, there's this like, like a thumbprint in there. And these things make no sense looking at your adult heart. But they make sense because you guys were born, not made. All right, so you spent months inside mom. And at that time, your lungs are not really functioning. I mean, they're not getting any air, right? They're filled with fluid. Um, so you're getting all your oxygen from mom, from the umbilical cord. And so it turns out you have two ways that you bypass the lungs in fetal life because fetus don't need, it needs a little bit of, you need some blood to go to the lungs so they can develop but uh, you want most of it to just bypass it. So here is that, uh, see this FO? Here's that depression. You can see it there. Yep. And um, it's called, and you guys, the fossa ovalis. And a fossa is a depression, so it means the oval depression. And it's found in the interatrial septum. And really, if we looked at the anatomy, can we go back? Yeah, if you look at the anatomy, uh, it doesn't, and I'm not thrilled with that, but this inferior vena cava where blood returns from your body, right across from it will be this depression. And so in fetal life, the blood came up through your liver, it came from mom's umbilical cord filled with oxygen, and it went into the heart and it shot right across to the left side. And as soon as you're born, it closes off and then the blood hits it and it can no longer go across and then it's forced to go to the lungs. But in fetal life, it takes a shortcut to the left side out to the body. You don't need to go to the lungs, it's already got oxygen from mom. So in fetal life, it's called the oval hole. For Raymond is a hole, right? So it's, it turns into the fossa ovalis shortly, uh, right around the time of birth, let's say. Yeah, so here we go. Blood is coming up and it just goes straight across. And so let's say the blood does go to that right side uh, and it's gonna go out to the body. That's cool, because you got lots of oxygen in it from mom. One other thing, you got one other shunt. And here is some blood. Imagine, let's look at our heart. Imagine that, so first of all, blood comes up and instead of going into the right side to the lungs, it just shoots across and then it can go out. But some of it is gonna go out the pulmonary trunk on its way to the lungs. And your fetal self says, you know, I don't need that much blood going to my lungs and my lungs aren't getting any oxygen. And so this is a duct when you guys are a fetus. And so here's blood going to the lungs. It's taking a shortcut into your aorta. So two shortcuts here. You've got one going from straight across the, there's a hole in the wall of your atrium to go from the right to the left side. And secondly, the ones that, the blood that doesn't go across, it is going to the lungs anyway. Then it takes another shortcut. It's like, oh, going to the lungs, wait a minute. Here's a door going to the aorta. I'll just go that way. And so um, this um, arterial ligaments, this oval, uh, oval depression, both of these things are remnants of your fetal life where as soon as you're born, it switches. And God, when you're born, you gotta get the fluid out of your lungs and they've gotta start working right away. And so the blood changes its course. But all the time you're in mom's amniotic fluid, the lungs are filled with fluid, you're not exchanging gases and you have these two shortcuts. All right. I think it's awesome. All right. Oh, good. I don't have to explain it again because I kind of went earlier to this. But remember, sulci. Sulcus is the groove. And you can look here. There's one that goes on top all the way across. It'll be the coronary sulcus. And then you'll have a groove that's in the front and uh, right down the back that are the 
interventricular sulci that are filled with fat and the important blood vessels that I'll talk about now in the last segment. Um, yeah, but the valves, of course. Um, I talked about them, but I'll show you again. This is a weird view, huh? But you're going to see this in a, in, in a curve cloud and you realize it's looking down on top. If you remove the atria, you're looking at the valves. And so this is the left side. You'll see this, this mitral or bicuspid on the left. On the right side, you're going to see the tricuspid. It has three cusps. They're kind of ugly, these valves. And then in the pulmonary trunk and the aorta, you're going to have those semilunar valves. You guys think you're getting it, the four valves? And we'll see why it only goes one direction. Um, it can, the blood can easily go in, can go in, but then when it tries to go up, the valves are going to shut. So these valves keep it moving in one way. That's what pumps do. They have valves for one-way flow. Oh, mitral. This is a mitre. What the bishops or popes wear. So it looks like the valve it does. So that's where mitral comes from. All right, one more view. So in these great vessels, you've got those pulmonary aortic valves. And the right side, tricuspid, left side, bicuspid or mitral. And this shows beautifully these tendinous cords attached to these papillary muscles. All right, I'm giving you a lot. If you haven't had this, maybe you had this in high school, maybe this is, you're just skimming through it, but uh, uh, a lot of anatomy, but you guys can work on it. Here's a view of the valves in person. See what I mean by ugly? Look at those things. I thought they'd be prettier, but they're kind of ridgy and they don't seem like they fit perfectly together. Look at that thing. And uh, and a lot of, you look at cadavers, a lot of the valves are uh, crappy looking. They got uh, gr uh, calcifications on them and stuff. So kind of ugly. All right, well, um, valve issues. I talked about uh, in the medical world, there's the plumbers and the electricians. Well, the plumbers uh, do a lot of work with the valves. The valves have to be competent. They have to work correctly, all right? And if you have stenosis, stenosis means narrowing and uh, often comes from calcification. You can look at, look how ugly these valves are. See the growths on them, those yellow kind of cauliflower growths on them? Not good, you know? You want them to be no growth, flexible, beautiful, but they start narrowing and then your heart's got to work harder to push the blood out. You can sometimes hear that as murmurs, things like that. And uh, they get so bad that uh, your, your, your muscle, your heart will get bigger trying to push past this valve that becomes, that's hardened and not flexible. All right, and I'll talk a bit later about artificial valves in the hearts. So we'll get to that. So if the valve really sucks, you can just cut it out and give you a new one. All right, there's no, well, in large oxen, there's sometimes a bone in the interventricular septum. I'm not, I will not ask you that, but in your heart, there's no uh, bones. You can't break your heart as if there's a bone in it. It's all muscle. We talk about the skeleton of the heart being uh, some connective tissue that's really tough. And it goes in that interventricular septum and especially comes up and surrounds the valves like this. And it just gives it some stability, tons of collagen fibers, it's this ring around here so that the heart is beating wildly, this muscle with no, with no bone on it, but the skeleton, this fibrous kind of ring around between the atrium ventricles and around the valves gives it some stability. So the muscle can work against it. It also works, you're gonna see as a um, uh, insulator of electricity because electricity will travel in the muscle, but it won't travel through all these collagen fibers. So it's gonna isolate the atrium from the ventricles and give a stability to the heart. Something in the middle that the muscle can, can count on, can, 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 can work against. Yeah, and here we go, looking at big picture, looking at this. And uh, again, you know, if you guys, if I ask you, you know, you take a drop of blood from your toe, make it go through your heart and, and go back to your toe. And it's gonna come up in this case, the inferior vena cava into the right atrium. It's gonna go from the right atrium into the right ventricle, past the tricuspid valve. It's gonna be pushed out the pulmonary trunk to the pulmonary arteries, to the lungs, back to the pulmonary veins, to that left atria, and then through the mitral valve to the big, biggest chamber, the left ventricle. And when that contracts, it's gonna shoot out the aorta. It's gonna to go to your body. All right. And this side is gonna be going to your lungs. It's gonna be uh, your, your, your pulmonary circuit, 
in your systemic circuit, it's going to be when it pushes out to the body. Yeah, nice. This is uh, something to study, huh? Look at that. That's where blood goes through and even has the valves on there. All right, now I'm finally getting to a particular muscle that needs a lot of blood because it's so active. It's the heart itself. So it turns out the heart gives itself blood first, All right? It's the first artery off the aorta. The first artery off the heart is gonna be the coronary arteries that may go to your heart. All right, just about done, you guys. Hang in there. Uh, the coronary arteries, of course, fascinating if you if you're a heart surgeon or uh, you know someone uh, that's that's having a, a stent put in or a cardi uh, coronary bypass surgery or or uh, grandpa had a heart attack, uh, so these things are these coronary arteries serve the heart muscle, and when they connect between each other, it's called anastomosis. Uh, when they, when they connect, it's called collateral circulation. You hear that too, where if one thing is shut off, another one can take over. But there'll be a part of your heart that if you shut off an artery to it, that's like it was like a dead end street, and that heart will die if it's if that if a thromb a clot you know stops that artery, and that's can cause a, a heart attack, which we'll talk a lot about. So these coronary arteries give blood to the heart. And so I'm gonna have you learn a right and a left, and then two branches off of each of those. That's the detail we'll learn for this class. So right off, as soon as you have the aortic valve right superior to it, there's gonna be two little openings on the right and left side. There's gonna be the right coronary artery and the left coronary artery. Why don't I give you the answer? The right coronary artery comes off and it's going to go around to the back of the heart, but it'll give off a marginal branch along the margin or edge. And on the back, we're going to call that the posterior interventricular artery run right down the back. The left is going to come off the left side and it's going to make the anterior interventricular right down the front of the heart. And then a circumflex branch will go around to the back of the heart. That's it, and I'll show you again here. Um, you can see that where they come off. And so even when you guys look at the she part, take a look right above that uh, aortic valve, there'll be two little holes across from each other. There'll be opening to the uh, uh, coronary arteries. And what's really interesting here is that when the heart contracts, blood shoots out the aorta, and that's when you feel your pulse, and when the, the body gets that rush of blood with each beat. But when the heart relaxes, the blood will come back and stop, and then it goes to the heart. So imagine during a heartbeat, your body gets blood, heart relaxes, your heart gets blood, body gets blood, and it relaxes, your heart gets blood. So um, when the heart is contracting, these valves will shut over the openings of the artery, and the heart is constricting the muscles, so the arteries are being constricted. But when the heart relaxes, uh, then the blood can shoot out to the heart muscle itself and the vessels can open up. It's, just, it's a small thing, but I realize that the heart is perfused when during diastole, when the heart is relaxing, your body is perfused when the heart is contracting. All right, just another picture. I, th I think I explained it just fine. When the heart, when you're looking at the hearts, uh, realize the right, it's the patient's right. Um, the right coronary artery will come off and it'll go around to the back, and it gives off a marginal branch along the edge, the margin. The left will come out and make the anterior interventricular, and then a branch goes on the back, we'll call the circumflex. Yeah. You may read in the literature, <laughs> I'm reading the heart literature every day, sorry, but they like interventricular also calls the descending artery, anterior descending artery. But, uh, interventricular means it's in that interventricular sulcus right between the right and left ventricles. Yeah, there's a little chart for you. Yeah. All right. And well, I promise, lastly, is that these coronary arteries will perfuse the heart, they'll give blood to the heart. And I give you the major branches. My God. I mean, if, if, if you get into heart, if you're a heart surgeon, like you, you learn a lot of smaller branches, right? And it's highly variable. So these are the things that are pretty standard. But um, before you want to do a heart surgery on someone, you want to do, it's called an angiogram. You want to get a picture because everyone's a little different. All right. But uh, these are the major ones. Everyone, I can say confidently, everyone has a right and a left coronary artery. And then usually you've got those two branches off of that that I had you guys learn right here. 
Now, the veins that drain the hearts are called cardiac veins. So coronary arteries go to the heart muscle. Cardiac veins drain the heart. And all the cardiac veins are going to drain to the back of the heart. We have this big vessel called the coronary sinus. And that will go into that opening in the right atrium that I drew for you in my big heart drive. Yep. So, and there's all kinds of minor branches, but the whole heart drains into this big coronary sinus in the back of the heart. And that will drain into the right atrium because it's bad blood. It's ready to go back to the lungs. All right. Woo. That's a hell of a big lecture there. Maybe hope you guys got a snack in there. Um, I just put this up here in case you want to help you. Uh, you can use it to, to quiz yourself. Um, oh, that's nice, isn't it? Yeah. So, you guys made it through? Well, either you did or you just zoomed to the end here, but uh, you are listening to me if you're hearing this. Um, so we went through uh, overview of the heart and then really the anatomy. I've given you the anatomy here. You can read about the anatomy. And I'll use my time in lecture uh, in person to go ahead and talk about ECGs and talk about heart function and how, how these things work. But uh, you guys put the time in so you've, you've learned the heart anatomy. And the lab is perfect. I mean, the lab is also heart anatomy. So uh, we'll do that first Kerr Cloud this week. We'll help you learn heart anatomy. This lecture will help you learn it. Get a blank piece of paper, draw the heart, draw the chambers, just like I did. See how you do, you know? And uh, with work, if you keep working at it, you'll know the chambers, you know the valves. At the end, I talked about the circulation of the heart, the coronary arteries, et cetera. And you'll get it. And uh, this anatomy part's like memorizing a map, right? I'll call it a lecture. Um, hopefully you guys uh, get a little head start on this chapter and uh, you read the chapter and uh, listen to this lecture, take some notes and uh, I'll get into heart function, bam, uh, next week. All right.